Welcome back to Kinetics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to continue complex mechanisms in physical chemistry and talk about the derivation of the Lindemann mechanism. So first of all, here's the reaction of the Lindemann mechanism. And basically, it's really just using steady state approximation and the derivation, but it's a little bit different than other reactions. Um, we have A, which is a, a reactant, plus M some other reactant. Sometimes this M can also be an A. Um, it just has to be two things colliding. A and M are in equilibrium with this A star and M. Now before I go into the A star, let me remind you the equilibrium. We have the forward reaction K1, we have the reverse reaction K minus one. Then this A star, which I put down here, can then be consumed to form the product with respect to K2. All right. So what is A star? Well, the basics of the Lindemann mechanism in terms of without math and stuff is this. A and M collide in such a way that A, which stands for activated, A becomes activated. It becomes higher in energy in some way. The fact that we have the star here means that it's in a higher energy state, which will then allow it to be consumed to form the product. Okay, so. It's really nothing different, though, than, than the reaction we saw in this right here. This A plus B, this C might as well be our A star. You're going to find this really isn't that much different. Okay. Now, let's use steady state approximation to actually determine what the rate law is for this reaction. What is the rate of the formation of the product with respect to time? If you need help with steady state approximation, I recommend you go back and watch that video in my playlist because we're going to use this assumption that the rate of change of the concentration of the intermediate with respect to time is zero. Now, what's my intermediate here? It's A star. Because A star is both consumed to form the product and formed through the reaction of K1. So A star is my intermediate. So my first step in steady state approximation is is make an expression for the rate of change of that activated A with respect to time. So dA star dt. Well, it's formed by K1, so positive K1 times A times M because those are the reactants of that reaction. Now, we have two reactions that are consuming A star, K2 and K minus 1. So minus K minus 1, this is going to be negative because it's consuming A star. And the reactants with respect to that reaction are A star and M. So times A star times M. Then A star is consumed by K2 to form the product. So it's going to be minus, because it's being consumed, K2. And the reactant with respect to that reaction is A star only. So A star. All right? All right, so let's set this derivative equal to 0. So I still have all this over here. 0 is equal to K1 times A times M minus K minus 1 times A star times M minus K2 times A star. Now, remember what we're trying to do after we set the derivative equal to zero. Whatever this species was, this intermediate, we want to solve for its concentration. So I need to get all the A stars on one side. So I'm going to add all of these A star terms over to the other side. So what I get is positive K minus 1 times A star times M plus K2 times A star. And then I'm left with, on the other side, K1 times A times M. Now, I have all the A stars on the left side, so I can factor out the A star. I factor that out, and I get K minus 1 times M, and then plus K2. And all that's equal to K1 times A times M. Now, I can divide through both sides by this term in parentheses. And when I do that, I get A star is equal to K1 times A times M and then divided by this whole thing in parentheses, divided by k minus 1 times m plus k2, that entire quantity. And that is my expression for the concentration of the intermediate, which happens to be a star in this reaction. Now, my overall rate of the reaction should be the formation of the product. That's what I'm concerned with. So the rate of change of the concentration of the product with respect to time, so the rate of formation of p with respect to time is equal to k2 times a star. Right? K2 times A star. All right? But I just found an expression for A star. So my rate of product formation with respect to time, so dP dt, is equal to K2, which is just from here, times, I'm going to substitute all this in, K1 times A times M 
divided by the quantity k minus 1 times m plus k2. All right, so this is the general solution to the Lindemann mechanism. This is the rate of the formation of the product P. This is the rate of reaction. All right, that's how you derive this, but there's actually a couple other things that we can actually do with this equation, okay? So I have the same equation written up here. We can make two assumptions, and this is kind of a common question that you'll see on a, an assignment or an exam. Let's look at the first case. What if we assume that k minus 1, so the k minus 1 rate constant, is way bigger than k2? So maybe k2 is very small, k one's very, k minus 1 is, relatively speaking, very large. So what we can do is, if k2 is really small, this k2 right here, we can more or less neglect it just because it's added on. We can neglect this K2 because it's multiplied by the whole thing, so that would, that would give us too much error. But since this K2 down here is added on, it's really small, we can more or less neglect it. So what I get is I still have this K2 out in front, but I have K1 times A times M, and then I only have this first term in the denominator because K2 is so small. So K minus one times M. And again, the only reason I was able to completely neglect this is because it's added on. If it's multiplied, I can't neglect it, but it's added so I can, I can get rid of it. And that gets me this right here. So you notice here that the M, M's cancel because they're on the top and the bottom. So if I assumed K minus one was way larger than K2, then my rate is now K2 times K1 times A over K minus one. Now notice, forget the rate constants for a second. This only depends on the concentration of A and only to the first power. So if we assumed that K minus one is way bigger than K2, and or if that was actually the case in real life, then the rate actually appears as a first order reaction with respect to A, it's first order, okay? Um, and that can be a very useful simplifying assumption if you know that K minus one is way bigger than K2. Here's another question. What happens if K2 is way bigger than K minus one? Now what do we do? Well, that means we have to count all the K2s, but we can neglect the K minus ones. So this K minus one right here, this K minus one M, this term, we can really just neglect that, okay? And so all I'm gonna be left with in the denominator is just this K2, all right? So my rate of formation of P with respect to time is now K2 times the numerator, k1 times a times m, and then all I have left in the denominator is k2. Notice now the k2s cancel, and all I'm left with is the rate of formation of p with respect to time is equal to k1 times a times m. That's as far as simplified as this can be. But now notice, I have two concentrations here, a and m. So it appears that when I assume k2 is much larger than k minus one, this reaction models a second order equation. First order with respect to A, first order with respect to M, so second order overall. So if you use one of these assumptions, it can actually change the apparent order of the reaction, okay? Whether it's first or second order, all right? So those are some typical questions you could see regarding the Lindemann mechanism, and we looked at the derivation in this video. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you for watching.